Cool. So good evening, people. Um, welcome to Orlando.net user groups. Uh, January 2021 session. Wow, oh, 2021. I can't even believe that. Uh, it's a little bit about uh, Orlando.net user oh, those, uh, you know, the, <coughs> those are the founding members. Wait, I thought I would tell you. I think we need to Take mute some. Sorry. Those are our founding members and uh, members at large who help us. And uh, if you want to follow one type, the best place to do so is on Meetup and Twitter, but we also have a Facebook page and we have a Twitch channel apparently, but um, I kind of have not been up on that one. And on LinkedIn, you can just search for Orlando.net user group and you should be able to find that. Uh, upcoming meetings uh, to be determined. Christos, if you know of any uh, speakers who'd be interested in speaking, we'd certainly appreciate your recommendation and welcome the speakers. So, you know, just let us know. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll be happy to contact them and bring them on. We have a social channel where we can put that information on. So, if you want me to put something in there where people can reach out to you, uh, it's usually the the reverse, right? We uh, we put it out there, and then we have CDAs and other people that want to talk that will reach out to you if, that, if you're happy with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they they can reach out to me on internal teams or something. So that's fine. Uh, so uh, before we get started, I wanted to kind of give people. Uh, the opportunity to talk about any amazing community announcements or anything like that. Uh, you know, if you have a, a open source project you would like to plug or any events coming up, uh, definitely uh, there's a raise your hand feature for Teams. Uh, hit that, raise your hand, and we can certainly go in a certain order. And I would say that. If you have questions during the talk, use the same feature. Hit raise your hand, and then when you get to a decent point, we can stop. Oh, there it is, John. You know, feel free to come off mute. Sure, might as well uh, throw out there a, a shameless uh, plug. Uh, I'm up here in in Greater Atlanta. Uh, you know, so and in, in Atlanta Code Camp's been a good friend of ours for for many many years now. Um, and we actually have a, a user group as well. Uh, we'll be doing our monthly meetup on the 19th. We meet the third, uh, Azure in the ATL meets the third Tuesday of every month. Uh, this month we'll be featuring Josh Carlisle with uh, five Azure services every developer should know. Uh, we just put that up there. I haven't even sent it out to the group. Orlando is hearing it before the Atlanta people are hearing it. Uh, but yeah, it, everybody's welcome, especially in this virtual day. So uh, yeah, please, we're, we're on Meetup uh, Azure in the ATL and come on over. Likewise, Santos, I need to start sending my people your way. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, that's how we survive, right? Uh, by, by helping each other. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, I have an announcement too. Uh, Orlando Code Camp uh, 2021. Uh, the in-person event will not be in person. Uh, we might look at doing a virtual event uh, sometime this year, but that is to be determined. Uh, like I said, tonight's talk is being recorded on uh, and we'll post it on YouTube. Uh, what I'll do is once we get it on YouTube, I will put a link to it in the meetup um, channel. That way, uh, in, the, in the meetup for the stocks, that way you get a notification. And I'd like to welcome Christos Marskas. Uh, I hope you pronounced your last name correctly. Um, Christos is a software developer, a dad, blogger, husband, speaker, and all around geek. That's awesome. Uh, he currently works as a developer advocate at Microsoft Identity. Uh, he helps uh, developers and teams leverage 
the power of identity and cloud. Before joining Microsoft, he was a successful entrepreneur uh, collaborating on companies such as Mark ID, Lockheed Martin, and Barclays. He's been building software for over 15 years and is a passionate open source advocate. He uh, would certainly love to hear about some of these open source projects, Christos. Um, he regularly contributes to o OSS projects and works closely with the developer community to make it bigger, a bigger and better space. Uh, Christos, uh, you know, uh, as you get started, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know that you also used to be a PFE, if I remember correctly. So tell us about yeah. your journey a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've been in software for about 15, 16 years now. And uh, I've done quite a few things. Uh, I've started as a traditional developer. I did a little bit of uh, IT support and then uh, devoted myself into software development. In 2011, I decided to uh, become a consultant and I was based in Europe back then. So um, I worked for a large number of companies, uh, different projects. And that was also the time that I got opportunity to work with things outside the .NET ecosystem like Node and uh, Java. And uh, just as, as uh, Node was uh, taking me over the dark side, .NET Core came to be, and then I was uh, I was back into the safe space of .NET. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I stopped there. So I, I continue to play around with different frameworks and languages, especially now that I work as a developer advocate, because I need to understand the pain points of different developers. Like if you're working with Java on our ecosystem, if you're running on Azure and you need to authenticate, then how easy or how hard is it for you? Uh, so it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, I was a PFE for about two years before I moved to the US, two and a half years, which meant that uh, I was working with customers uh, in a consultancy kind of a way, but rather than doing it for three months or a year, uh, a PFE is a consultant for a day, as I would like to explain the role, where you go into one customer, you do something with storage, and the next day you move to another customer and you do something with VMs, and then the next day you touch something totally different. So it was a lot of fun, but a lot of traveling as well. Uh, even for the European standards, because I can't even imagine being a PFE in the US and having to travel all over the country. But uh, even in the UK, I had traveled quite a bit, so I got a little bit fed up and I thought uh, career pivot was the right thing to do. And I moved into marketing. Uh, very, uh, very left field kind of a move, but it was marketing and the developer tooling, so it was not totally disconnected to my background. In fact, one of the reasons why I joined the marketing team was because they needed somebody with strong technical skills and you can take a developer and make them a marketeer, but you can't take a marketeer and make them a developer, at least not as quickly as um, the other way around. So I spent two and a half years or two years. Yeah, about two and a half years working uh, as a as a marketeer for developer tools. And that was a lot of fun because it gave me a glimpse on how the this this part of Microsoft is working, how we it's into developers, what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. And after two years in marketing and not really playing around with code much, I felt that I needed to sharpen my skills, my technical skills, and I came back into a technical PM role and now working as a developer advocate for identity since last uh, March just when the coronavirus hit. In fact, uh, funny onboarding story, on day one, I went to the office, I met my manager who flew up from LA. We spent a day together and then before I even got a desk, the only thing I got was just my laptop. I was told to go home and never come back to the office because everything went into a lockdown. So I don't even know 95% of my team. I haven't really met them in person. But uh, ever since, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, fun stuff. We we'll try to do developer advocacy. Uh, things have changed quite a bit, as you guys experience now. Everything is virtual, so uh, it gives us an opportunity to speak to a lot of people that we wouldn't do in the past. UK, Australia, Asia, or you guys in Orlando. I don't have, I don't have to fly down to, to do this kind of event, which is fantastic. But at the same time, there are other challenges there, like uh, you know, meeting fatigue and people getting tired. So hopefully, I'll try to keep the the session entertaining and fun and you can learn a few things and hopefully ask me a few questions as we go through and if you if you really want to ask questions feel free to raise your hand or uh, come out of mute i don't mind being interrupted how does that sound for an intro uh, sounds great thank you christos and uh, uh you know looking forward to a great meeting so i'll just sure. unmute cool thank you uh, everybody can see my slides Yes, we can see it, fine. 
Fantastic. Uh, I will skip through the first couple of slides since they're in intro to myself. Uh, what I will say also is that we do have a stream channel and uh, I know they haven't really done a lot with uh, Twitch, but we are very, very active on Twitch these days. We have a show every Monday and every Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific and we uh, we go live and we build things around identity. It's not just identity. In fact, what we say is the show is a show about identity uh, that uh, is not just about identity. We build end-to-end -end solutions. So if you have a single page app that needs to uh, speak to Azure or needs to speak to APIs and needs to do that securely, identity is a small element of that, but what developers need to see is the end-to-end -end solution. If we're just doing identity, it would be a three-month show and we'll be done with it. But uh, we try to bring a lot of guests as well. So if you have build something with identity if you want to build something and learn live with us and you don't uh, don't mind doing it live then reach out to us and we'll build something together we have a very exciting four or five months ahead of us we have some really amazing speakers and uh, developers from the community coming to talk about things like next week we're doing go with uh with terraform and uh, azure ad all securing um go apps and CICD pipelines. So it's it's fantastic. It's a great experience. So make sure to follow. Everything goes onto YouTube as well. So if you can't join us live because most of you work or I assume you work, then uh, you can catch up on the 4 to 5 show, which will share the links afterwards on YouTube. Now, um, what, what am I doing here and why you should care about Microsoft Identity? In fact, why should you care about not storing uh, user passwords? If I were in the room with you, I would I would ask I would start by asking how many of you here have actually rolled out your own identity system? I raise my hand. I've done it in the past. I've done it a few times, and I am guilty of that. There you go. Santos is also raising his hand. Um, it's something that we do not want people to do. Uh, I, I did it wrong. I made major mistakes when I was doing it. It was very very complex. I had to understand how things worked. Uh, you could screw up at so many different points and end up like one of these companies, or hopefully you never, but we know that every single day at, or every single week, somebody makes the news um, by having their user's information being compromised. And um, we talked about Troy Hunt just before I joined the show. Uh, and if you haven't met Troy Hunt, uh, he's got a fantastic website called Have I Been Pawned? Uh, you can go and, and submit your email address just to find whether your uh, email address was ever a victim of one of these uh, hacks. But just to uh, highlight some stats here, uh, over the years since he started doing this, which I think it was back in 2012, 2013, uh, almost 500 websites, major websites have been compromised with over 10 billion unique accounts across the board. And... Uh, with uh, 113,000 different dumps. That means that uh, this information becomes available somewhere. He goes and grabs it and puts it there. It's scary to think that we have 10 billion accounts compromised uh, over those years. And it's not, as you'll see here in the picture, it's not just the, like, you know what? You might say, well, I'm not I'm not creative or, or I'm not Adobe, but you can see there's Domino's Pizza there, Yahoo, uh, Dropbox. So no matter what you do, no matter what kind of operation you do, what kind of uh, website you're building or solution, as long as it's in the public domain, it will become a target at some point. Uh, some of these uh, sites or anything that you put out there in the public domain uh, is is a fair game. And there are bots that are scanning GitHub every single day for compromised uh, keys, API keys, passwords, secrets, and what have you. So um, just because you don't have a major uh, product doesn't mean that uh, your product is not going to become um, a target. So uh, don't be under that delusion. Uh, so I, I work for Microsoft Identity. Obviously, um, my interest is in pointing people to using delegate authentication with a Microsoft Identity platform. Uh, and the reason why I love our product is because it scales so fantastically. There's a number down there, 30 billion daily authenticated users. That's an insane amount of, of people that we authenticate every day. And it's not just the authentication data that we get, it's also the, the analysis that goes behind uh, threats and what have you. So some of the free tools that you get is uh, if you are using the identity platform or our identity platform or Azure AD or even uh, Office or whatever, 
we always do active checks against your account. So if you're logged in from uh, the US and suddenly you see an alert coming from Germany because somebody tried to log in with your uh, username and password, then you get that kind of information. It's in fact quite scary. If you use the My Apps uh, free app, then you can go and check all your Office 365 products and see uh, how many times people are trying to compromise your accounts. Uh, and the nice uh, thing about the the platform is that it doesn't have it don't have to be a one billion user company. You can have three users logging in every day. It will still scale with your product. And you as a developer, you don't have to ever ever have to think about how am I going to grow my database? How am I going to uh, manage all these users at the end? We do it for you. And uh, I'm going to skip the other marketing fluff there. So let's say I've convinced you and now you want to get started uh, or your manager comes to you and says, Santos, you need to build a website that needs to authenticate against um, something. I want you to uh, store the users or I want you to manage users and for them to have a profile on the app. Perfect. So uh, one of the first questions you're going to ask yourself as a developer is, do we already have something that does it for me? Do we have an identity provider somewhere? Do we have a database somewhere or a system? Uh, most of the companies um, will either have built something over the years or they might have an identity provider like Azure AD. So you want to reduce the, the amount of research and effort that it takes to build a system like that. How quickly can you get off the ground? Obviously, you want to spend as little time as possible investigating, learning, and integrating with a, an identity platform. Will it support your language? Obviously, if you're building with .NET or uh, .NET is first class, but if you're building with anything else like Java or Node or Python or Ruby, will will it have the right uh, tooling for me? And finally, what do you get out of the box as a developer, right? It's not just the scalability. I mentioned scalability, you get that for free. You don't have to worry about that, but what else do you get? Do you get any libraries? Do you get things like multi-factor authentication or do you have to roll it out yourself? Do you get conditional access? How can I control access to my solution if uh, if we need to block people from logging in, say, from outside the US or from outside a different region. So uh, these are the things that people usually ask when they come to uh, implementing an identity solution. So Microsoft Identity provides you with a lot of things out of the box for free. Let's talk about cost first, because some people might say, well, how much is it going to cost? If you already have an Azure subscription or if you already have M365 within your organization, then you already have Azure AD for free. You don't have to pay for that extra. If you, anytime you spin up an Azure AD, uh, sorry, an Azure subscription, you get Azure for free. Now, while, as you grow and as things grow, then you're going to end up with some kind of a, an enterprise agreement with Microsoft. So again, Azure AD tends to be included in that. Uh, and then if you are a developer and you don't have Azure and you really want to have a play around with the identity platform, there is uh, the M365 developer program. Uh, which allows you to spin up your own Azure AD with sample data. That's users, you know, OneDrive data, SharePoint data, graph data. So you can actually have a, a system to play with. Uh, and we give you uh, a lot of things. Like we give you the libraries so you can start with your own um, platform and framework out of the box. We give you organizational data, as I said. Once you uh, authenticate, then you get access to Azure. You get access to uh, all the... Uh, other data you might have, like SQL, everything that sits behind the uh, your on-premises environment, and um, everything is available through the Graph API as well. Uh, one of the other benefits that you get as a developer is that you don't really have to worry about things uh, like user management. What happens if a user leaves my company, and, and then how do I manage access to my app? I've been in companies before where people had left and for two years, they still had access to production systems because even though they, they left the Azure AD, they had other systems that were using usernames and passwords, and those passwords had never been rolled over. So uh, it, it's scary to think about it, but once somebody leaves, how quickly can you cut off access to all the systems in the organization? And with, uh, with integration into Azure AD, you get that automatically for free. So you as a developer don't have to worry about that. And then IT is also responsible for uh, enforcing things like multi-factor authentication, uh, conditional access, uh, certain policies, and what have you. And finally, safeguarding access, right? So uh, you as a developer, you add the, the integration into your solution. And then from that point on, as long as you do it as per our instructions or our best, best guidelines, then uh, you get 
uh, the, only the people are authorized to access the code can access the, the solution and only the people that have the right permissions will access part of the uh, solution based on your um, role based authorization or what have you. So a lot of things that um, otherwise you would have to implement yourself come to you for free. So how do you get started? W what are the components of uh, the identity system here? There, there are two main bits. One is the Azure AD or, or B2C and we'll talk about B2C in a bit. But the, let's say Azure AD, uh, you need to configure something. Uh, this is very similar to uh, Google and Facebook. If you ever had to consume those services, you have to go into these services and create an application registration. Uh, this shows you shows the intent that you're going to be using that system for authenticating. So with Azure AD, we have an app registration where you can do that via the portal, or you can totally automate that and script that via the Microsoft Graph or PowerShell or the CLI. So you, you go into Azure, you say, I'm going to have a web app or a console app or a mobile app that authenticates against Azure AD, and I want to use my organizational users. Perfect. Once you do that bit, then the next step is to go back to your code and add some, um, some libraries. If you are new to the whole identity platform, if you're building a brand new project, then you can say, I'm going to add the Microsoft Authentication Library, the MSA library, uh, into my solution, and that brings uh, the integration. Um, I'll take a very quick stop here to mention that right now, there are two different libraries in the uh, Microsoft Identity Platform. We have the ADEL, the old uh, Azure AD authentication library, which is going out of support. Uh, in June, we announced that there will be no more new features added to the library. And as of June 30th, 2022, we will be deprecating support for that library, which means that you have a year and a half to upgrade your systems if you're still relying on ADEL for your authentication. Any new features, any new support, and there are a lot of benefits in using and upgrading into MSAL, I will be supported going forward. So if you are using Edo and you need to upgrade or if you need some support, reach out to us. We'll help you uh, get over the line into using MSAL. Now that I have your library, you might say, uh, perfect, I, I'm using MSAL, but you might also be bringing a project that has been finally running in production for the last three, four years, already using OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. So uh, there's a very good chance that you don't want to strip out all that code, and that's absolutely fine. You can bring your own OpenID Connect library, as long as it's compliant to that, uh, to that uh, open standard, then you point to our endpoints, uh, the well-known endpoints for Azure AD, and everything should work out of the box. So uh, you can come as you are. In some cases, you might want to add access to a backend API or some of our APIs like storage or graph or other things. And in that case, you may have to go back into the Azure portal to uh, fine tune those permissions. But these are the two main components. One is in the Azure AD, you do your configuration. Uh, you say what kind of app you're going to be authenticating against Azure AD. And then on the other side, you go and add a few lines of code in your code and uh, off you go. I did mention slightly uh, B2C, so let's let's clear the, the, the space here, right? So there are two main decisions that you have to make when it comes to, or one decision based on the, the, true pro, the two products that we have when it comes to authenticating against uh, Azure or against the Microsoft Identity Platform. If you already have organizational users, if you're building a line of business app, then this is Azure AD for you. These are internal users that need to authenticate to an app and pull organizational data across. Think of Outlook or think of um, you know, OneDrive for your organization. You sign in with your organizational account, and off you go. That's that's an internal line of business app. If uh, if you're building something for external users, let's say you're Walmart or Whole Foods or whatever, and you want to create a solution that your customers can come in, create a profile, and then um, buy stuff. Or if you want to build a forum that people can come in and uh, talk about something, or if you're building a mobile app, and you want your users to be able to create a profile and manage their profile and settings in the, within the application, then this is where you use Azure AD B2C, the business to consumer or business to customer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this uh, this is at its basic form, a username and password database. That's how we, where you start. You can also add social uh, accounts. So if a user does want to use a, or create a brand new account, they might want to sign in with their Facebook or their Google account 
or any other Open ID Connect compliant service, let's say Twitch or GitHub, then that's that's uh, something that you can also offer as an option. So two two main uh, decisions here, right? We have internal users, organizational users using Azure AD, and then uh, B2C, which is more towards consumers. And that's that's it. Simple as that. I'm not going to uh, go into standards or uh, protocols or RFCs, but all you have to know is that Azure AD and B2C are built on top of OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. So if you have any compliant libraries or if you want to use something else other than MSAL, then you're free to do so. There's no proprietary technology there. And with that, because I have been talking for the last, I don't know, 30 minutes, I would like to uh, to run a demo. So let me come out of my slides and bring my command line. The first demo will be um, a .NET web app. So I'm going to let me make it this bigger so everybody can see this. Uh, I'm going to do a .NET new. Uh, we'll do web app and then we'll do auth single org. And then I also need to give it a name and it will be .NET UG. How about that? So what this one will do is uh, find your project. Oh, what? What? Oh, it's Dasta. Sorry. Apologies. It's been a long day. Uh, so what this will do is uh, spin up a, a new Razor Pages web app using .NET 5, and I've also configured authentication in my app. So let's go and see how that looks like. Uh, if we open this with codes, and bring it over here and make it nice and big so everybody can see that. Is that the right solution? Oh, yeah, I know why. So let me close this one down. Or go to CD into one and code. Like that's a lot of solutions there. Okay. Uh, so here we have our solution. Let's close that down. I'm using our new library, which we'll talk about in a bit, called Microsoft Identity Web, that manages both the authentication and the token acquisition for my web app. Uh, so we have the Microsoft Identity Web that deals with the middleware, creating all the wiring up for the OpenID Connect. And then we have uh, Microsoft Identity Web.UI, which is responsible for signing in and signing out the user. It's all part of the DLL, so I don't really have to create any custom views for that or uh, individual views. In the app settings, we need to populate these. So we have to add the domain, uh, the tenant ID and the client ID. We can go and create them, them in a bit. And then in the startup, I just want to show you how, uh, how much it takes to wire up the authentication. So you can see here we have on line 32, we have uh, services.authentication. We're saying that we're going to be using the OpenID Connect defaults and then add Microsoft Identity Web App. And with uh, one line of code, if you want to think uh, uh, that, then you have everything. In fact, we can even remove that and say dot add Microsoft Web App authentication and pass the configuration. And that's it. That's all I need to do. Uh, down here, we have the add Microsoft Identity Web which in effect adds the sign in and sign out pages. And down here we have the user authentication. If you were to take a, an existing .NET Core application today and you wanted to add authentication, you just need to bring those two libraries I mentioned before, uh, add this line of code, add uh, line 41, and then add line 63, the user authentication. And off you go, that's you to go. So let's, uh, let's configure it. In fact, let's run it and see what it takes to wire everything up. So I did say that in Azure AD, we need to go and create a new registration. So this is our Azure AD tenant. That's my test tenant, which I'm using. It's all nice and free. So let's let's call this one UG web. I'll create organizational accounts. I'll leave this blank. I'll register my app. So I have my app registration here. Nice and dandy, I need to go and add some authentication. This is in effect where we say, what kind of platform are we going to use? So if I click on this, the add platform, 
then you'll notice that there are a few choices. We have web or we have single page apps if you're using Angular or React or Vue. Then we have uh, mobile and desktop applications. Obviously, we're using web because it's a server side component. Uh, our redirect URI will be HTTPS localhost host 5001 and then sign in underscore OIDC. Where did I find this one? Let's go back to the code. You notice that in the app settings, we have sign in OIDC here. So I just need to match that. And our it's solution- just a, just a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's I just, this is Todd. I just had a question. If you're going to do a, if you had a Blazor web assembly, would you use a single page app model for that? Yes, you are. Because okay. in effect, it is a single page app, right? Gotcha, yeah. The, I just want to make sure. Yeah, the web assembly is a single page app. If you're running server side Blazor, then it is a web app. Okay, cool, thanks. No worries, thanks for the question. Uh, let's go back into our configuration. So here we are, uh, we don't need that. Let's add that, no, add that there. So configure, and that's all we need here. Now I have everything configured. I just need to go and populate my uh, settings. So my application ID, I grab it from there. Uh, application or client ID is the same, so let's add it here. I think this is uh, C much. Go uh, on Microsoft.com. Christo, so when you uh, you know obviously you know you're putting the standard ID and client ID and stuff, but uh -huh. uh, when you uh, deploy this app into production. It, mm -hmm. Uh, can are you going to simply hook this up to read from Azure Key Vault or something like that, or how do you generally handle that storing? Oh, this? you mean this? This these settings are not private. This there's nothing secret here. There's nothing sensitive here, right? So I don't need to hide anything from you guys. There's no client secrets. So for now, this is all we need here to uh, to make things work. If I were using uh, if I were using uh, authorization flow right now, this one is using implicit flow by default. We're mm -hmm. fixing it to use the authorization uh, flow. So uh, if that was the case, then I would have to use a, a client secret. And that would be something I would be populating from Key Vault. You're absolutely right. And for that to work, uh, you can rely on the, uh, there's an ASP.NET Key Vault provider that allows you to wire up things at startup, which means that I, I could leave my, let's, let's assume that I was using the authorization code flow and I had client secret here, right? I could leave this blank, and then in my startup, I could actually, um, as long as I had a client secret value inside my um, inside Key Vault that matches that, then it would go and pull that information for me directly. And you wire that up inside your startup. Sorry, not your your program.cs. And I have a I have a key, I have a GitHub repo that shows you how to do it and a blog post that shows you how to do it end to end. So uh, you're absolutely right. If you were to put any secrets here, it's very common. You might have a, a database configuration here. You could have uh, an API key to your storage or whatever. Then you don't want them in your code. You would hide them away and use the uh, the service principle or your local account. So what I have here is I am already logged in with my organizational account. And as long as I'm running, as long as I have authenticated against my local VS code or my Azure CLI, then the provider is clever enough to pick up the local account and try to authenticate against Key Vault. So you need to configure Key Vault as well uh, to have to give to that account permissions. Now I'm I'm the owner of both my Azure subscription and my VS code. So every time I create a, a you know a Key Vault, I already have permissions, but Let's say I was to bring you into the project. I would need to give you permissions to do that. Got it. But it's a it's a it's a fantastic experience because you never ever have to worry about secrets. But what we have right here is no secrets, right? Okay, understood. Thank you. No problem. So let's uh, spin up a new terminal. I think I have everything wired correctly. So dot net run, building and running. Okie dokie. So let's open this one now. Oh. Did I screw up my uh, comma somewhere? No, there's no debugging issues. So let me see. This should be the right one. Huh. 
huh, must be one of these days. So that's fine. That's fine. I haven't run dot now my local machine for a while, so I don't know why this one's complaining, but almost feels like it's dead. Let's try to run it again. We can come back to this one in a bit, but I'm surprised that this one is failing. Is it giving any kind of uh, messages in the debug console or anything? Nope. Let's see. No, I don't think could be something with uh, that. I was messing up with the certificates the other day, but even if that was the case, then it should open the HTTP five. I was saying refresh four hundred one. Ooh, four hundred one unauthorized. Why? Maybe it's my. Uh, See much guess the one on Microsoft.com. This should be the one. Let's check very quickly on that one. Make sure that I have the right settings. Uh, hopefully they can figure it. That can, yeah, that's the one. It's logging on Microsoft.com. And that's my overview. See match guest on Microsoft.com. Hmm. I might come back to that in a bit, but that is a little bit weird. I mean, I already have our solutions running. Anyway, uh, I will I will revise that one because I have a few more things to talk about. But uh, yeah, that's real one. That my startup is correct. Oh, there you go. What a muppet. Web authentication, not web API authentication. No. So yeah. this is good, right? We we now know if we make that mistake, how to fix it. There you go. Right. Okay. I was like, it's supposed to be working out of the box. That's a little bit embarrassing. Okay. So I have already, uh, remember, I'm using my C mask from Microsoft, so that's my test tenant. So I will try to uh, sign in. Uh, it's the first time I'm signing in, so it asks for a consent, uh, whether I want to give a consent to look my profile, and if you want to know why that's coming in, if I go back to my app registrations, am I in the right one? Yeah, I am in the right one. So one at UG, if you go into the API permissions, it's trying to read my uh, profile. The, the default permission is user.read, so it's trying to read my profile. So I will go back into my app, and say, yes, I'm more than happy for you to, uh, where's the window? See, here. Yeah, I will consent. I don't need to consent for my organization, accept. And then with that, the URL specified in the request is not much the reply URL. What did I miss? Uh, sign in this isn't it? Okay, let's look at that again. Did I, ah, yeah. It's a dash, it's not a typo. So many mistakes that we're capturing today. Let's save that one. See, now you can know how to troubleshoot. The whole point of the session is troubleshoot. The reply URL is not correct. So if you go back into the app settings, it is dash and not underscore. So that's where I screwed up. A uh, fairly common mistake. So I'm glad everyone's paying attention. So let's try to... Question. Yes. It's from... Uh... Yeah, Tim, go for it. Yep. Okay. Uh, I, I think I know the answer because I think it just flashed on the on the last uh, Azure uh, portal page that you run. But if I wanted to configure my app to be able to run locally and then also um, run on like a QA site with an Azure, uh, that's what exactly. So I can add multiple redirect URIs for my app. Yeah. Uh, okay. Perfect. At uh, test.com. The only yep. caveat there is uh, yeah, it's happy there. You can only do HTTP testing on your local machine. So you can't do HTTPS yeah. testing, HTTP testing outside your local environment. Everything else has to be HTTPS. Yeah. Which is for, for very good reasons, right? So yeah. uh, let's leave it at that. So that won't break. So I can have multiple URIs. It doesn't mean that it has to match all of them. As long as one of them matches, then it's okay. So you know, I can even go and save that. 
And then as you can see, I'm already logged in and I can sign out. So these pages are all managed by uh, the built-in uh, configuration inside the DLL. So I don't have to go and roll out my own uh, signing pages. In fact, if we look into the pages under shared, we have a login partial. And what we do here is in effect, we just say every time I need to click on the login, it will go and um, take me to the signing page. And uh, if I'm already authenticated, then it takes me to the sign-in page. If I'm not authenticated, it will take me to the sign-out page and it will display my name. So it's it's all done for me by the, the system. So I don't have to you know, create custom pages here, which is great. And it will do the two-factor authentication if I already configured that. It will do all the things that I need to out of the box, right? Um, you saw what the configuration would have been for an API. It's exactly the same. But let's say my app was calling into things like uh, an API that uh, you know I need to sign in my user and then call another API. How would you configure that? And I know that that has brought shivers in the past on developers every time they had to think about it. So we did actually make it very simple. So here I can say dot enable token acquisition for downstream API. Um, I don't have to provide any scopes. I can leave it as default. And then because we're going to be calling an, a downstream API, we also want to add a cache so we don't have to go and get the access token every single time that we need to do a call to the downstream API or APIs. So uh, I can say I want to add an in-memory token cache or a session token cache or even a distributed token cache. So there you go. And I don't know if you saw this flashing as well, but there is uh, the ability to register a downstream API. So if you have a service that calls that API, you can register it here. And then, oh, sorry. And then every time, that was not the right one. And every time you need to call that API, that service that calls into an API, we will add the authorization header automatically for you. So we inject the header and we make an author authenticated call to the downstream API without having to uh, think about it twice. So it's a fantastic way to inject services and into the authentication process and uh, make them available to your um, controllers or your code further down the line. That's what, four lines of code, right? So I didn't have to write any code for that. Uh, it usually takes more code, more configuration rather than code to get this end-to-end -end solution. Uh, so uh, this is one of the demos. We'll move into other demos in a little bit. So let's go back into the slides. Oh, that's the wrong slide. This one. This is probably one of my favorite slides because we do say come as you are and we make a, a funny reference to Nirvana if you grew up with Nirvana, but uh, this slide has, doesn't have a single Microsoft technology. In fact, we're more than happy to work with all the services and we do work with all the services. Right now we're working with the IntelliJ team to add support for uh, Azure AD inside the ID. We've already done it with uh, Rider. The Rider team has added uh, Azure AD integration. So when you do file new project in Rider, you can get that nicely integrated as you do with Visual Studio. Visual Studio Code will follow as well. We're happy for you to run your services anywhere. AWS, I did already mention you can have services or servers running on AWS authenticating against Azure AD. And if you use Arc and manage those VMs or those machines in the remote uh, data centers, you also get managed identity, another extra benefit digital solution or whatever, any language. Uh, we don't really want you to just use .NET. Obviously, if you're using .NET, you get all these uh, extra benefits. But if you're not, if you're using Node or uh, Python or Ruby, again, you get libraries and support for these languages as well. And finally, whether you're running serverless, Kubernetes on-premises, we support you uh, along the way, so fully end-to-end. -end. But if you are using first-party services, if you are using .NET with uh, our services, then you get additional benefits. GitHub integration with uh, managed identities and service principles allow you to deploy uh, code and infrastructure without using any secrets, all, all handled for you by your um, GitHub Actions. Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code integrate with Azure, and if you're logged into the services, you automatically get access to the services in Azure via managed identity. Uh, you can pull easily data from team, SharePoint, Exchange, and everything else that sits behind the uh, 200 different API surfaces that we expose via the graph. Uh, you can run anywhere you want. So we support uh, identity and uh, quite a few things out of the box inside uh, services like functions and app service where you get easy auth with Azure AD. 
And then in Kubernetes, you get managed identities and service principles supported. And finally, we're working on making the story for the Power Apps or Fusion developers uh, a lot easier. So you can have a Power App that calls into Graph via the Azure AD connectors, or you can have a Power App calling into an API, all authenticating end to end with um, the Microsoft Identity Platform. So a lot more secure, a lot more robust. And if you think about it, we're probably the only provider out there or the only company out there that really cares about the developer story, the production story, the IT story, the DevOps story, everything. And everything is covered end to end. So as long as you set up your Azure AD correctly, then that whole story My, my CEO doesn't really care about these things because he knows that everything is nicely secured. And I can also build and run against uh, different systems without having to change my code or whatever. Everything is integrated and everything works uh, as expected out of the box. Okay, you also get single sign-on. Um, I use my phone all the time, uh, probably more than I'm using my main machine as I move around. And the nice bit about that is that I can have single sign-on for most of my organizational apps. I can't even remember the last time I had to put my password into my Teams or Outlook or Office solutions running on my Android and iOS devices. And that's beautiful because it definitely improves the user experience. And you also get single sign-on with uh, web browsers and what have you. So uh, with uh, Hello uh, on Windows and uh, the tight integration with the Windows ecosystem, I don't even use my password. In fact, I have to have a password manager for my domain account because it's uh, 60 characters long. And God forbid if I ever lose access to my password manager tool because I won't be able to access any. Now, uh, we also give you the ability to reset your password via uh, SSPM. So technically, Azure AD provides you the ability to reset your account even if you're not part of the um, inside the org anymore. I don't have to call support. Other things, uh, and again, user provisioning, graph, and publisher verification are probably things that you don't care about unless you are building a SaaS solution or you're an ISV. But you know, let's say you you build the next best Outlook and everybody wants to get it, so it's a SaaS solution. If they want to download the app, they want to make sure that it comes from you. So that's where publisher verification comes into play. Uh, and I talked about single sign-on, and then more single sign-on authentication libraries, right? I did say MSAL is the way to go. If you're using Adel, let us help you migrate off that. But then again, if you use any other OpenID Connect library, we're more than happy to accommodate you. In fact, there are a lot more uh, popular um, libraries out there like Passport for Node. Uh, up until very recently, we didn't really have a Node uh, solution uh, or a an, an Node offering. Passport was there to fill the gap. Now that we do have an offering, it's, it's down to what you want to choose and why. Uh, it is secure by default, right? All the the Emsos, uh, libraries are tested and secured, and um, you know your IT team uh, can feel confident about that. And I did mention about Graph, and we'll look at the Graph example in a bit. Uh, this is a bit to see customization. Uh, in fact, I'm going to switch to a demo here because the demo shows much much better what that experience looks like. So let me come out from here. Uh, let me come out here and here. Let's close this one down. And let's go into my BTC. So uh, my BTC tenant is where I configure my external um, authentication for my external users. And I have done a few uh, demos in the past, but recently, like yesterday, my, my partner in crime, JP, was like, dude, we have a customer that wants to uh, change the tab order on their custom login page. So they want to go username, password, sign in, and then click on the links. Can we change it for them? I was like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not going to change the product until we gave them a stopgap solution. So um, you can fully customize the experience to make it look and feel like a proper, proper uh, solution. So uh, I can't remember if it's this one. This is not the one. Let's see. Let's run the this example. Is this one? So this is the vanilla. This is what you get out of the box, which is not too ugly. But then again, it doesn't look like my app. And if I wanted to look like my app, then why would I want to do that? Because my customers are logging into my website or, or they come into my website, they see the, the landing page and then they go into the login page, which is totally different. And it, 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 it doesn't really break anything, but it, it's not the best user experience or on your phone or something else. So a lot of our customers want to customize that experience. And uh, 
it's fully customizable, obviously. There are some rules that you need to follow when it comes to that. But if I switch to a different flow, uh, let's go back into my flows here. Was it this one I was playing with? Let's look at the properties. I think that's the one. If I go into my page layouts, there you have it. So what we have here is uh, I'm using a custom page. I said that. I put a page into storage. Um, it's publicly available. So it's privately available, but only available to my um, my Azure AD B2C tenant. And I have also configured the course policy. So only Azure AD B2C can access this. And you can, you can have multiple versions. So you can change the versions here and you'll notice that up here it says unified sign in and sign in, uh, sign in and sign up page is different because it's custom. So if I were to run this flow and I come here, boom, that's it, fully customizable page. I'm not the best designer, so please don't judge me. But if I were to uh, come here, I can actually show you that the tabbing is different as well. So rather than going uh, username, forgot password, uh, password, sign in and that, it actually works as expected. So if I go there, 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 there. I wrote some JavaScript code for that. And my JavaScript is not the best, but it's working. I also changed the UI of these buttons. So I'm using Bootstrap instead of the default look and feel of um, of B2C. So uh, this this is all it took. It probably what two hours of uh, effort to put everything together, and off you go. Fully customizable. Whether it's a mobile app or a, a web app, you get that kind of a nice experience. Back to the slides. Back to my boring slides. Ah, right. We have questions there. So everybody's happy with customization. I hope you'll I'll see a lot of custom. We have a question. Yeah, we have a question from Re Reza. Yes, like hi. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I just had a question. If we want to um, have a um, flow to include like authent multiple authentication with mm -hmm. like a authenticator, Microsoft authenticator app. Mm -hmm. um, so that they get a notification, they approve through mm -hmm. their phone, and then we let them in. It, how, what would it take to, to do that? Are you talking about B2C or Azure AD? Uh, B2C. So for B2C, we don't really have uh, integration with, uh, like we don't have out of the box integration with Authenticator app. We are working on that. But in the meantime, you can add things like Twilio Verify. Uh, you can create a custom policy. Uh, or a custom flow, sorry. So you can actually create a custom policy that will allow you to use any provider. And in fact, we did a stream just before the holidays where we added um, Twilio Verify into a custom B2C policy. So if you want to see that, then I, I can point you after the, the stream into that, um, after this session into the stream so you can see how uh, we did it. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. But I, this is a, a this is a very common question. Like I want to use an authenticator app rather than email or text. And uh, mm -hmm. right now, B2C only offers email and text. So I, I totally get your pain. Um, so if you want to use the Azure authentication or Azure AD, then is that something that we can get uh, out of the box? I think with Azure AD, you get it out of the box, but for B2C, you don't. Uh, but as I said, we are working on making that uh, light up. Okay. But with uh, would, Azure AD, you'll be able really get... to. to... Uh -huh. Go on. So with Azure AD, would you be able to show us in the in our like the, the demo website? Um, uh, it's going to be I, simple I, enough. I haven't configured one yet, uh, but I'm happy to point you to uh, one that I've done in the past. So, will that right. be okay? Cool. Thank, thank you so much. Yes, sure. Thank you. No problem. So uh, we do try to eliminate uh, the friction for developers as much as possible, especially with BTC. So uh, it starts with very simple username and password, and then you can extend and uh, be very configurable as you go through. And I do agree that XML policies are not the sexiest or the finest uh, thing to work with, but at the same time, uh, with a great power comes great responsibility. So you have a lot of uh, configuration and flexibility in the system, but it requires to uh, play a little bit with XML. And we're always here to help if you need to have some very custom uh, design and policies, which a lot of our customers are doing. So next one. 
I talked a little bit about Microsoft in the web, uh, and as the slide shows, if Marcia can do it, then Bob can do it too. If I can do it, then you can do it too, friends. Um, Sometimes people ask, where does Microsoft Identity Web sit when it comes to uh, MSAL and why do I need to use that uh, over MSAL? Um, up until this point, ASP.NET had um, two different systems. They had the uh, ASP.NET Identity, which was built into the, uh, the, the framework. And you would go file new project in Visual Studio, select Azure AD, and then you would be able to authenticate users but when it came to acquiring tokens to go and speak to other services, at that point, ASP.NET would say, I don't know what you're talking about. You need to use a different library. And that was where you had to go and download MSAL, add MSAL to your solution, and then authenticate and pass the, the appropriate tokens. And that was a little bit of a disconnect there. So what we did is we we said, let's let's unify the whole process. So you, we use one library called Microsoft.Web that not only does the authentication, but also does the token acquisition and token management, like caching and what have you. So Microsoft Identity Web is, is sitting on top of MSAL. That hasn't replaced MSAL, but it still relies on MSAL behind the scenes to do uh, both things for you. And then um, if, you, if you're if you not working with ASP.NET Core 3.1 or 5 and you're in previous versions like ASP.NET Core or ASP.NET with uh, the full framework, then you can fall back into the full MSAL.NET. Uh, and also MSAL for Java or JavaScript, Python, iOS, single page apps, and Go and what have you. So we provide you that. And um, if you don't want to work with any of our MSAL libraries, you can also bring your own OpenID Connect, as I mentioned earlier on. Any compatible library will work. I'm not going to spend too much time in like what was different, what's different now. You saw that it only took like a, li a line of code to implement everything. Uh, but if you still want to tap into the underlying piping or uh, the underlying middleware of OpenID Connect or want to uh, use the JWT bearer authentication libraries to go and in, investigate or do things or tap into OIDC Connect uh, events, then you have the capability of still doing that. So these libraries are still available to you even though you're still using Microsoft Identity Web. So it doesn't mean that we eliminated all these in favor of the, the super simple stuff. You still have all the the pipelining available to you after the fact. So all had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, need to understand how OpenID Connect worked, a lot of uh, a need to understand how OAuth2 worked, whereas now uh, we give that all that to you for free. And if you want to add more or um, make things more complex, then you can do so. Um, graph. I don't know how many of you here have had a chance to play with Graph, but um, it's it's a fantastic API, especially for organizational um, data. I don't know if you ever had to upload a document into OneDrive programmatically, but that was a pain because OneDrive had its own SDK, it had its own login uh, on top of that, so you had to authenticate, and then it was such a mess. Now with um, Microsoft Graph, everything is super simple. Everything that is available to your organization is available to you as a developer as well to bring some um, rich interactive experiences for your users. And the best example I can always give is if you are using Outlook today, then every time you go to the two to send a new email, uh, what Outlook will do behind the scenes is uh, a graph call into uh, an API endpoint to go and pick up the, the most recent or the most uh, popular people that you work with most of the time. So it tries to be clever and say, well, Chris, you're always working with JP, so I will put him at the top and then I'll put Todd because he's your manager and that's the probably the second most popular person and then Hannah, what have you. So um, it optimizes the experience for me well, rather than me having to go and look into the gal and trying to find the email address and resolve it and hover over the person and see if they're uh, active or not or on holiday. It pulls that information for me and it makes it available. So I love Graph because it can really create some very powerful solutions and it can extend to SharePoint and any data that you have inside the organization, CRM, BizTalk, and uh, on and on and on. And you can build some uh, powerful experiences, whether it's uh, automation tasks, whether you're doing uh, Jupyter Notebooks, whether you're doing uh, HoloLens solutions, it's all available to you via the Graph API that it becomes the connective tissue of all the disparate data and solutions you have in the organization. And it's very important to know that it is organizational data because sometimes people say, well, I, I've already 
authenticate my user with B2C, how do I get access to their graph data? <laughs> Obviously, an external user will not have any organizational data whatsoever, and B2C does not have a notion of organizational data. So uh, there is no graph API for uh, B2C users. So just make this clear. There is a graph uh, API for managing your B2C tenant, but not for the underlying data. So uh, just to make sure that uh, people don't get confused there. And it's all uh, managed by the identity. So if you haven't seen uh, Microsoft Graph in action, let's jump very quickly into a demo. So uh, aka.ms.ge, Graph Explorer. I don't know which account it will pick by default. Let's see. Oh, it picked up my Microsoft one. Interesting. Right. Uh, this is one way to start working with graphs. So let's say you're building a solution, but you don't really know what you're going to be asking for. So you want to like go and do some uh, exploratory work here. And the Graph Explorer is fantastic because it has most of the popular APIs. I did say it has 200 APIs, so not everything is here. But let's say, uh, did anybody here watch the the build event, this uh, the Microsoft build event this uh, this year? They may have got a glimpse of uh, Scott Hanselman demoing a solution uh, where he was managing his lights in the room uh, based on his team's presence. So um, if their kids wanted to come into the room and didn't know whether he was busy or not, the lighting in the room and outside the room would reflect his status on Teams. So if he was in a meeting, the kids knew not to come in. And that's all easily managed by Graph API and a couple of other functions that you know uh, listen to events and then re relay that back into the IoT lights that he had. And if I remember correctly, that's part of the uh, the presence. Is it under here? No, I think it's under uh, presence, which may, may not be here or exposed. But the one I was uh, talking earlier on is people I work with. So if you notice, I, I just goes me people up here. Let me make this bigger so everybody can see this. And it says me people, which is great. And now I can um, I can run the query. It will go and find the people I work with. I did say JP is my most popular um, person I work with. There's also a beta uh, endpoint. This is where we. This is an evergreen or everlasting beta point where we do all the experimentation with our data, and then when People say, well, this makes so much sense that it needs to become part of the GA solution or the, the mainstream one. We move it to the V1. So if you want to experiment with new solutions, <coughs> you can come here and run the beta. Now, uh, usually that returns a lot more data. So if I were to say, uh, let's get my information so we don't expose some other person's information. If I use my V1, there's a, there's a small subset of data that comes back, but if I use the beta endpoint, you'll notice that there's a lot more information that comes back uh, all the way down here. So you can experiment with things, and then if you go into documentation and you find an API that you want to come and test, you can say uh, me dot uh, messages or calendar. This is all the email I have. Here, now that's my Microsoft email, so I'm not going to show that. But I could use a different account. Uh, you can see that I can play with. In fact, you can also do selects, so you can use old data to uh, select some data. The other thing I really like about this, and let me zoom out because we might not be able to see that, is the code snippets. And let's change that to be me again. So how would I do code snippets? Interesting. It does work. Ah, oh, you know what? It's because the beta. If I go to the mainstream one, what? C sharp. Is my code snippet broken? I got these cards. Huh. Interesting. Why is it not working? Let's see, people I work with. I think this is broken. Because it usually returns back with the code snippet that you need to use to get that information across. Huh. It's one of these days. And then you have the toolkit components, which are, are uh, there's a graph toolkit for your front end that you can use to easily add functionality into your front end. And it includes authentication and everything else all included there. But I'm really disappointed with my code snippets now. Why? 
What's wrong? My profile. I think. Let me let me sign out from here. Uh, sign out. Okay. Uh, I think you don't miss. And I will sign in with my test tenant. I wonder if that will fix the problem. Okay, so let's do run query. Ha, oh, they're letting me down today. Graphics for I'll have a chat with the graphics for team. I don't know what's happening here, but it usually works and it's fantastic because it shows you exactly what code you need to use to uh, to pull that information across. My email, run the query. Oh. Disappointed. Right, let's go. Let's move on. What else do I have in there in my slides? I don't think I have anything else in my slides other than. Uh, I mean, I can I can do one more demo if you want to, and that will be if I go into my. Uh, let's remove this one and let's add a single page up. In fact, no, I'm going to say I don't want that. I'm going to do. Uh, is that my BTC or my normal one? That's my normal one. Okay. Overview, quick start. So one thing I can do here is I don't know how to get started. I don't know how to write the code. I don't have any code. I want to quickly experiment with things. So let's do a web application. Any web or single page app. Let's do single page app. We'll do a JavaScript with auth code, which means that we don't really have any secrets anymore on my single page app. So let's do that. It will say here, it will ask me, it will guide me through the process. It also says you need to have a, an Azure subscription. You need to have a Node.js app and Visual Studio Code. <coughs> Excuse me, which I have. So I'm going to make some changes here. This will make the changes for me in the in the actual app registration. If you haven't used this one, it, by the way, it's fantastic because it will do everything for you and will also give you the code. So I can now go and download the sample. I will open this, unzip it somewhere. Let's go and uh, grab this here, copy. Let's paste it into my somewhere here. I've got projects. Let's paste it there. Right, done. Let me open this in command line. I say uh, to run everything, just do npm install and npm start. Again, I'm a noob to node. I have no idea what I'm doing. So let's do npm install. It will do that for me, downloading half the internet as we speak. And now I can do npm start. It's listening on port 3000. So let's go and test this. Is it really listening? Local host. The thousand. And we can sign in. It will even call graph data for us. Uh, and I think we're in the. Yep, on my CMAT domain. So here, back here. Where's my pop up? <clears throat> we'll sign in. Again, it asks for my permissions, which I will gladly give. Now, I did ask for permissions because, check this out, we are actually, let me make this, um, because we're actually pulling graph data. So I will accept it and I can see my profile, which I've already consented. And if I were to read my emails, it says, wait a minute, um, I've already, you've already given consent for your profile, but you haven't given consent to read your email. So I will do an incremental consent because um, Maybe I don't want to upfront give it all access to everything, my contacts, my emails, what have you. I might choose not to do that. And uh, in the past, it was either all or nothing. Now you can be a little bit more uh, piecemeal as a developer and only request permissions when you need them dynamically. And that's what's happening right now. It's dynamically asking for uh, email access. So if I say yes, you know, so now it says read your email here. Uh, so I will accept that one. And with that, interesting, it asks for it twice. This is all my uh, email from my 
sample account, so I don't have to worry about anything. And if I were to look into the code just to see what's happening or where things are, I can go to code and open this so we can uh, look at where the identity configuration is sitting. So under app, we have the uh, graph config, it should be here, it's the auth config. This is where it added the client ID from my app registration I had there. It also added the local host and configured my app registration with that specific local host URL. Also the authority here, which is the endpoint that we need to use to authenticate and validate tokens. And um, th there are two different options. You can do a pop-up or a redirect. We include both uh, in the uh, index of the HTML. You configure the UI and how you want to authenticate. You can include either a pop-up or the redirect. It's a great way to get started if you don't know how to do things. And this UIJS is the one that changes the UI based on whether you're logged in or logged out and it needs to dynamically populate the UI. But uh, I find this a fantastic way to get started, even for language that you don't know, like how would I do with PHP or um, Go or Python? And there you have it. You can use that functionality there. And the other thing I want to leave you with is another piece of functionality that we recently added into Azure AD and the integration assistant. So this one looks at what kind of app you're going to look or it looks at what have you configured already and then just say, you know what, I'm going to be running a single page app. It also goes into um, like, is this calling another API? You can say yes. And then if I say evaluate my registration, it would say, well, you got the right configuration for the redirect, you got redirect URIs with HTTPS, but oh, you haven't configured your API permissions yet. You need to go and fix that. So if you already have something and it's not working, you can come and validate things through here as well. And uh, with that, I'm going to go back into my slides to remind you that we do have a, a regular stream that we talk about these things and go into some um, 300, 400 level configurations. We also have a Tuesday TV, uh, Learn TV show that we go into the very, very fundamentals, what's identity, uh, all the one-on-one -on -one content. So make sure to uh, follow us either here on Twitch or YouTube, and make sure to reach out to me and JP on Twitter if you have any questions or email or whatever. And that's me. I will stop sharing now. So I have a question. So, uh, you know, when you talked about uh, identity, I think you uh, largely covered the identity of the users that are, uh, you know, connecting to the system, logging in and stuff like that. Now, there's also identity of the resources themselves where they can access other resources. Can you talk a little bit about that, particularly in the context of Azure? Yeah. Yep, I can talk about that. So let me just uh, jump into my portal. May not be, I may not have. Uh, yep. Wait. Yeah, that's not the right one. This link, I need to go back into sign outs. So as, as we mentioned before, there is this notion of a managed identity, and that's something that allows us to communicate with other services on Azure without really having to configure certain things. So imagine if I had a web app that needs to speak into Key Vault and uh, do that securely without me having to expose the Key Vault keys. So if I were to go into here, into my Key Vault, which I think it's already configured, uh, are you sharing the screen? Oh, sorry. I am not sharing my screen. Apologies for that. So screen two. So you should be able to see my uh, screen now, although things are taking a little bit longer to load. I don't know why. Yeah, I can see a screen. Cool. My key vault is uh, being defiant now. Huh. Let's go back into... The portal is frozen. The demo guides are not with us today. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, do no, that. I mean, it's it's easier to demo rather than talk, but the, the whole yeah. point is that if I have a web app or if I have a, a Kubernetes cluster or if I have a VM that needs to speak into a service, then I don't want to have to explicitly configure that service because uh, if I if I were to access my key vault, I will need to come into uh, my key vault and I need to look into my keys. Can't remember where they are. I haven't used them in a while. Properties? No, I, it's not there. Uh, permission resources. It's down here. Uh, secured. I remember how to get into my keys now. And maybe I don't want to get into my keys because I don't want to show stuff, but uh, let's say I wanted to provide access to my cure. Why is it taking so long? The only thing I need to do is um, the resource will have an identity, which can be automatically assigned by uh, Azure, or we can configure that explicitly ourselves. Maybe my app service will be faster. Oh, everything seems to be crawling. And there are two different um, managed identities. One is the system assigned one uh, that lives with the service. So an app service can have a managed identity that is system assigned. But if I delete that uh, resource, if I delete my web app, then my the managed identity will die with it. And there's the user assigned one where I explicitly go and configure uh, an identity and I assign it to one or multiple resources. So uh, this is the demo we did at .NET Conf. And here, if we go under identity, uh, you know, so there's, uh, it is on and there's a system assigned one and that's my object ID. In effect, this one is saying, what can I do with my mouse identity? And if I go into role resources, it doesn't have any roles. <coughs> Maybe I have not assigned this one. And I can use that mouse identity now to go into Key Vault and speak to Key Vault directly. But we need to configure Key Vault for that. So let's let's do one more try. See if that works this time. Uh, key Vaults. So here, access policies. Aha, quite a few of them there. Uh, I've I've used this a few times. So uh, there is an access policy for quite a few managed identities. You can see there's only two selected, and I'll tell you why. Because for that managed identity, I said I only want to be able to. Ah, that half things are not loading here. It's not a good day. Oh, there you go. Interesting. Wonder if it's because I'm zoomed in. No, it's literally broken. Huh. So when you come here, you can say, I want to assign a, a, a new uh, a new identity, let's say the one that we configured for our web app to be able to access my key vault. And I only want to give it two permissions. It's not even working there. I think the whole page is broken. Let's try to load one more time. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Even loaded the names. So you'll notice that here as uh, cm.neconf demo, which is the one we're running at uh, .neconf. And we have a specific uh, managed identity that only has two permissions. One is a list and one's a get. We need a list so that uh, the web app can actually list all the secrets and then a get to be able to go and retrieve the specific secret. And with that permission, I don't have to set anything else my web app will be able to come into my key vault and pull the, the appropriate secrets. And I think I have a few secrets here. Um, that we have a SQL administrator login and a SQL administrator password, which I'm using in my web app to go and um, authenticate against my key vault. I also have a config value that gets populated from key vault as the .NET Core app bootstraps. Now it can be a web app calling into SQL. It can be a web app calling into an API, like let's say I had Azure Functions, and I can also um, create a secure uh, connectivity between the web app and the, my APIs in uh, in Azure Functions using managed identity. So it's not just external services, it's also for my own services that I can use. So super powerful uh, features, it can be an API calling into SQL Server, Kubernetes calling into 
other services. It can be a VM calling into another VM. Um, and there's a whole set of services that do support uh, minus identity. And as we move on and, and extend, there'll be a, even more services added into that uh, capability to use minus identities to speak to other services. Excellent, thank you. Cool. Do we have any other questions or uh, I know that somebody mentioned uh, single sign on for Azure AD and I'll be pointing you to that later on uh, just to show you how it's configured end to end. Seems that this is a no. And that's a wrap. Again, you can you can always follow me on Twitter if you <clears throat> if you have questions or if you get stuck with anything. Uh, in fact, the other day I had somebody saying, "How do I do Azure Functions with Easy Auth?" Calling them from a console app. Uh, so you know all these different scenarios that um, people are trying to configure with Microsoft Identity and and Microsoft Identity Platform. I have a I have a quick question. Well, maybe not so quick, but complicated question for you. Sure. If you don't mind. Uh, I, I've got a multi-tenanted app um, where each tenant is basically gets their own subdomain off of our um, our main URL. Um, we currently use Identity Server to kind of broker the um, authentication. So we support um, either your Office 365 Azure AD account or G Suite, primarily are the two that uh, that we integrate with. Um, but what we're allowed or able to do is based upon the the first request coming into the subdomain we kind of do some subdomain home realm sort of discovery and say okay based upon you being acme mm -hmm. we know that your preferred identity provider is g suite so we're going to route your uh your login request out to identity server and give identity server a hint saying hey yep. route them to g suite to yep. you know to authenticate they come back in and we get all the the goodness and look them up for their their roles within our application and, and life is great Mm -hmm. Is there a way that I can simulate or, or replace the identity server bit using Azure AD B2C to kind of basically just rip out identity server and just replace it with that and sort of simplify my life a little bit? You should be, although that would be a complicated setup with custom policies. It's doable okay. as long as you're willing to take the hit. And it will be a one-off hit, but um, yes, that will be the, the closest way to replicate what you have with identity server. And don't get me wrong, I mean, Identity Server was fantastic for certain things like that, whereas we don't really have a, a very simple solution out of the box. But uh, reach out to me, um, reach out to me uh, over email, and I'll route you to the right team to help you out if you're uh, serious about doing that migration. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love Identity Server, but it is it, there's nothing simple about it either. So it's uh, you know you, you you spend a lot of time getting it working, and then uh, you, know, you forget yep. half the half the configuration, but. Uh, absolutely. There are pros and cons with uh, all the tools, right? I'm not saying that our yeah, platform absolutely. is perfect. In fact, it's there. There is still ongoing work on making things easier and better for developers. So uh, the whole point is getting your feedback and making it better. But reach out to me. We'll be more than happy to help you. I can send our uh, BTC team to uh, have a discussion with you. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Appreciate it. Cool. Any other questions? All right, excellent. So where can we uh, find uh, all the uh, you know code samples and everything? Is that on your GitHub page? We do have a GitHub um, repo. Just let me find the information for you and add it here. Uh, I will put all the contact information in one go rather than doing it individually. Damn, my machine is crawling today. What's happening? It's 2021. Yeah, I know everything is uh, everything is not working well. <laughs> you ran well, npm install. It's still taking a, a while. I, I did. I did. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't. In retrospect, no. I love Node. It's 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 a uh, it has its pros and cons. So let me just add that and then GitHub. Is it okay if I put it on the chat? Yeah, sure. Actually, that's the thing I like about uh, Teams versus Zoom, right? In Zoom, when you close the call, it's gone. The chat yeah. is gone. But in Teams, it's still in your chat. You can go back and refer to it at any point. Yeah, 
Indeed. There you go. All of that. So, um, you know, where to find us? We're on Discord as well. So if you have questions and you don't want to uh, use email, you can use Discord. But like uh, uh, for major escalations, like if we need to involve other teams, it's always easier to do it via email because I can forward that thread into somebody else and say, this is what we tried so far. Um, let's help out this uh, customer or this developer. Oh, I just uh, thought about this question, but uh, you know, you were showing like a ASP .NET web app. Uh, now, does Razor support any kind of like? Uh, yep, Raz like Razor pages. Uh, well, we're using Razor pages now, right? So right. I did not have. Uh, it was not a full MVC. So anything that is running on top of ASP.NET Core. Uh, supports the latest Microsoft at the end of the web. In fact, I did a, a blog post a few uh, weeks ago using gRPC with uh, Azure AD. So Microsoft at the end of the web with gRPC to create a super fast um, kind of a gRPC service that was being called by a gRPC client. And at the time, it was just a console app. But uh, it just goes to show how uh, easy it is to integrate with uh, Microsoft at the end of the web. It just took a few lines of code. So anything that it is on top of ASP.NET Core 3.1 and later will benefit from um, Microsoft at the end of the web. And prior to that, we still have msal.net, so it's not like you have to roll your own stuff. It's just a little bit more code. That's the only difference. OK. And does the uh, jump from ADAL, oh, sorry, ADAL to msal, is that is that huge, or what's the general story behind that? Because you said that you would, you would help if there were issues. So it seemed like it's a tough jump. Is it? Well, it, it depends. Uh, uh, so some customers may have a, a ten-year-old .NET app that they need to upgrade. So that takes about, uh, depending on how involved it is, but it took us about six hours to migrate a very old. Like we went into GitHub. And we're trying to find all code right, for in, in our repositories and samples. So we're looking at all their tags, all their tags. And eventually we found out this random ASP.NET project that was using ADA. We're like, okay, that's a perfect candidate. And uh, it took us a while, not, not because the not because of the the ADA to MSL migration, but because of the, the whole solution was a little bit misconfigured or whatever. So it was not just the authentication code, it was the other things that were not working. So we spend more time fixing the other things rather than doing the ADAL to MSL. But let's say you're using uh, ADAL for JS or whatever, or um, older libraries, then uh, it might be, depending on what you're doing, it might be more or less work, but I would say it's, it's half a day's wor worth of effort to migrate. Uh, and again, if you get stuck, we can help you. Now where you can see incredible benefits is if you're going from a, an old, say old, let's say an, a 10-year-old ASP.NET app into ASP.NET Core 5, where you not only migrate the, the, the framework, but you're also migrating the authentication, then you can really cut down on the amount of code that you have to integrate. So let's say ASP.NET MVC 2 to ASP.NET Core MVC with .NET 5, it's going to be uh, night and day. I had a project on GitHub from three years ago when I did a sample for a customer when I was a PFE. And uh, apparently I left my client secret in the GitHub repo. So Microsoft IT scanned the, our repos and they reached out to me and said, well, uh, Mr. Christos, you left a secret over there. So that uh, repo needs to be cleared out and, and um, remove any uh, issues. Now, luckily I had removed the secret way uh, far in the past. So I did, that secret was not really used anywhere. In fact, that whole operating station was gone. But I was super curious. I was like, that's a three-year-old code with uh, a significant amount of, uh, uh, I blogged about it the other day. Like I had a lot of authentication code. I had custom views. I had uh, admin pages. I was like, how, how much effort is it going to be for me to migrate it to .NET 5 and upgrade the authentication? Um, and I spent less than an hour doing the whole thing. Hmm. Because I was just ripping out code, right? It was like remove views, remove, remove custom OIDC provider, remove X. And then I went into startup.cs, I added one line of code, and authentication was working. I was like, damn, that right. was nice. Um, do, do you have like a video of doing that or something, or did you? 
I, I don't have a video, but I have a, a blog post that I posted this week. So if I I can share the link with you guys, the TO45. So and it's migrating old authentication. I have the two repos on GitHub as well, so you can go and uh, compare tags to see where things are. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, any, any other questions from anyone else? All right, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>